Good morning, everyone. Yes, morning. Um, I'm Dr. Dhwani Shannon, and I welcome you to the ocular surface disorder session. Um, we all see ocular surface patients day in and day out in our practices, but a lot of times we don't know what to do about these patients. And sometimes we also feel a little baffled by the variety of management options. So we are going to try and make it a little more simpler for all the practicing ophthalmologists present here. So firstly, I would like to welcome our chairwoman, if I may, Dr. M. Vanati. She is a professor of ophthalmology of cornea, lens, and refractive surgery at Ames. And she's had an impressive climb up the ladder in all her years at Ames. Uh, she's academically very active with more than 250 publications internationally and more than 80 chapters in various ophthalmology books. Secondly, I would like to welcome Dr. Shisha Kumar, who's a cornea refractive and cataract consultant and MS at the Eye Foundation Coimbatore. He's a recipient of various prestigious awards and has more than 650 publications and six chapters in ophthalmology books. He has innovations like CANVAC, CCC, and CTG to his name as well. He's also our keynote speaker, and his topic today is sterigium management, all you should know about. So, sir, I would request you to um, please take over the stage and start with your presentation. Thank you, Dhwani. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, uh, KOS uh, and uh, Dr. Dylan for the opportunity. So, he told me to present everything about uh, terrorism, but uh, it will not be possible to do that because uh, uh, terrorism, of course, like uh, last week we had a session, AOA session on terrorism, uh, which went on for almost three and a half hours. So uh, it's not uh, uh, possible to cover in 15 minutes. So I'm just going to uh, present uh, some practical tips to optimize uh, surgical outcome in uh, terrorism surgeries. Uh, as we all know, it is uh, one of the commonest problems we encounter in our day-to-day -day practice. Uh, and uh, many surgeons still consider uh, this humble terrigium to be unworthy of their uh, talent and skill. And this uh, trivialization of terrigium surgery uh, combined with the poor surgical uh, technique uh, are responsible for uh, poor visual outcome, poor or variable outcome of uh, terrigium surgery. And uh, we do not have any set protocols as such uh, how to go about managing these uh, cases, uh, different types of terrigium. But and a variety of uh, procedures have been uh, proposed, and uh, the very fact of having so many surgical procedures uh, says that uh, we are uh, still uh, like not perfect in uh, perfect in doing the region surgery. So, what are the uh, conditions? What are, when we have to operate on these uh, terrigium cases? Uh, it's like if uh, we see a progressive terrigium, if there is visual disturbance because of uh, terrigium or if it is uh, disturbing the patient cosmetically, or in case of recurrent terrigium. These are some of the indications for uh, uh, terrigium surgery. And uh, as I have already mentioned, uh, we do not have set uh, protocols, uh, but uh, uh, with experience over a period of time, uh, like uh, we get good results uh, with this particular type of surgical procedure for a particular type of uh, uh, terrigium. So for a single head terrigium, conjunctival autografting is the gold standard and uh, you can even try amniotic membrane transplantation or uh, conjunctive tissue grafting from the terrigium itself. Or uh, for, for double head terrigium, if it is a primary double head terrigium, you can do a split conjunctival autografting. Either uh, you can split the conjunctiva vertically or horizontally and uh, you can even take superior and inferior bulbar conjunctival autografts and uh, amniotic membrane transplantation or uh, uh, conjunctival tissue graft from the terrigium itself uh, can be tried in these cases. And the recurrent terrigium, uh, again, uh, conjunctival autografting is the gold standard. You can even include a, a thin block of uh, uh, limbal tissue in the conjunctival autograft, limbal conjunctival autograft, and uh, adjunctives like the mitomycin C or even amniotic membrane transplantation along with these procedures can be tried in these cases. So any procedure for uh, terrigium, uh, it should prevent recurrence. This is uh, the important goal of any uh, terrigium surgery. And it should act like a barrier, a limbal barrier, uh, to prevent conjunctivalization of cornea. 
and uh, that should be minimal or no complications at all uh, with the surgery and it should be cosmetically acceptable to the patient as well as to the surgeon. So uh, we already know uh, perigium uh, surgery, the gold standard is the conjunctival autotransplantation. However, there are occasions uh, or uh, conditions where superior bulbar conjunctiva may not be available uh, for you in cases like glaucoma filtering blab or a patient who is a glaucoma suspect or a patient with the double head terrigium. In such cases, uh, we can try uh, what is called uh, uh, conjunctival uh, uh, tissue grafting from the uh, uh, terrigium itself. So here, what we do is we take a, a sheet of conjunctival epithelium from the terrigium tissue itself, and you separate it and uh, keep it aside. Uh, then uh, remove all the fibrovascular tissue of the terrigium and place this uh, conjunctival sheet or epithelial sheet from the terrigium itself on the base clitoral bed and fix it. So oh, the histopathological examination has been done on this uh, uh, sheet, conjunctival sheet on the terrigium. It's been actually uh, the normal conjunctiva uh, shows a two to four cell layered epithelium. Uh, with uh, no dysplasia or uh, no malignancy, whereas the conjunctiva overlying the uh, pterygium, it was found to be uniformly thick with eight to 12 layers of uh, epithelial cells and a few goblet cells uh, and uh, a few capillary networks. But uh, with the uh, similar uh, like uh, findings, like uh, uh, there's no granuloma or dysplasia, and uh, thus it makes it a good source of uh, uh, graft of our selected cases. So this is a conjunctival tissue grafting uh, procedure being shown here. And I inject uh, fluid that is either a lignocaine or a BSS of conjunctivally into the pterygium tissue and uh, fashion a graft, thin graft from the uh, pterygium tissue itself. Uh, this is the epithelial sheet from the pterygium. And once it is uh, taken, it's slightly thicker as compared to the normal uh, virgin conjunctiva. And uh, you just uh, remove all the fibrovascular uh, uh, tissue from the pterygium. Then place this graft, either you uh, glue it or uh, you can suture it. Uh, and this works well in the indicated cases. Uh, uh, we actually published this particular uh, technique, uh, this con concomitant use of conjunctival tissue graft from the pterygium itself. Uh, uh, this was published in uh, IJO 2018. And uh, the results are good with this particular technique. And uh, as far as the recurrence rate was concerned, it was less than 4% uh, in our series. Uh, and we even compared it with the inferior conjunctival autografting for a similar indication. Those who are having filtering blebs or uh, those glaucoma suspect patients, uh, where we compared inferior bulbar conjunctiva with the conjunctival tissue graft from the terrigium itself. Again, the results are comparable in these uh, cases. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Both the techniques of inferior conjunctival autografting and conjunctival tissue graft from the terrigium itself they are excellent alternate options with the comparable outcomes with the no additional risk of significant complications. Coming to double head terrigium, this is again a difficult uh, problem to manage. Uh, and there are various options uh, available now. Conjunctival autografting is the gold standard again. You can take grafts from superior or inferior bulbar conjunctiva. You can uh, take a superior graft and split it into two parts, either horizontally or vertically. And uh, vertically, again, you can uh, uh, have a graft with orientation and without orientation. And then conjunctival tissue graft from the pterygium itself or uh, amniotic membrane lamp uh, transplantation can also be tried in these double-head pterygium patients. So vertically split conjunctival autografting, uh, we actually uh, have published this particular technique uh, where we split the conjunctival graft uh, vertically into two parts and uh, without uh, limbus to limbus variant uh, orientation, we place the graft on the base clitoral bed. Why this uh, concept has come is uh, when you are splitting the graft into two parts and uh, orienting them with the limbus uh, to limbus orientation, you see there is a gap here. It may not cover the entire base clitoral defect. And uh, this area is a potential source for uh, 
Tanjung Civilization of Power. You can see a nettle of tissue coming from this particular area, very area, over a period of time. So in order to avoid that, you can just uh, slightly graft uh, down and uh, place it on the base clearer area, which will cover the entire uh, uh, base clearer defect. And uh, the results are uh, uh, comparable. Uh, this is the technique. Uh, you take a slightly large graft and uh, uh, split it vertically. And uh, don't change the orientation, just slide it on the base clearal bit. So here, uh, this is the limbal end of the uh, graft. It has gone down. Uh, and this is the other part of the vertically split graft. Uh, so these cases uh, do very well. Uh, <coughs> and uh, this is actually published, this particular technique in uh, IJO. The, uh, the recurrence rate was less than 4%. And uh, after uh, like uh, a long follow-up, this is actually another uh, publication on the same technique uh, in the Women's Journal of Ophthalmology. It's a long-term analysis of uh, this particular unconventional way of uh, doing double head regime excision. Uh, we included uh, more than 100 cases in this particular uh, technique and uh, the results are uh, very good. That is less than 2% patients had recurrence with this technique. And we even compare this vertically split conjunctival autograft with the uh, limbus orientation and without limbal orientation. Again, the results were comparable. Uh, the percentage of uh, recurrence was less than 4%. So what is uh, pterygium recurrence? Uh, it is nothing but uh, regrowth of fibrovascular pterygium like tissue uh, encroaching upon the cornea uh, or beyond uh, limbus or fibrovascular recurrence, uh, which is attaining the same degree of uh, uh, encroachment uh, on the cornea as the original lesion, or regrowth, uh, which is exceeding one millimeter onto the cornea. This is called the uh, uh, recurrent pterygium. So on the left-hand side, what we're seeing is the corneal recurrence, and this is a conjunctival recurrence. Here, uh, you can see a barrier, uh, which is uh, preventing this uh, recurrent pterygium uh, encroaching upon the cornea. So it is a conjunctival recurrence. So still there is a barrier effect. So we need not do anything for this particular case, but uh, this particular case, which has the corneal recurrence has to be taken. The management aspect of recurrent pterygium, uh, we have various options, which are available. Mitomycin C, conjunctival autografting, uh, conjunctival limbal, uh, autografting, uh, CLEG, and you can uh, combine uh, conjunctural autografting with select now and uh, amniotic membrane transplantation along with these co uh, combinations. So uh, the mitomycin C, which can be uh, used in 0 0.04 uh, to 0 0.04% uh, concentration, there are various protocols uh, which are suggested by different surgeons and uh, different uh, authors. Uh, uh, so it can be used uh, preoperatively, it can be used intraoperatively, or it can be used postoperatively. And uh, there's a nice paper uh, which was published way back in 1998, uh, which actually compared 0.02% of mitomycin C with the 0.04% of mitomycin C. And uh, as far as the recurrent rate was concerned, it is almost the same in both the cases. So we can go ahead and use a lower concentration as the other side effects are less with the lower concentration and the recurrence rate is as comparable to 0.04%. Another nice paper, which was uh, again published way back in 99, uh, which compared limbal conjunctival autotransplantation uh, versus mitomycin C for recurrent pterygium. Again, the recurrence rate was almost comparable uh, with both the techniques. Uh, and there are various papers which you compared intraoperative versus postoperative mitomycin C. And again, uh, the recurrence uh, rate, there was no significant difference uh, between these two uh, techniques that is intraoperative mitomycin C versus uh, postoperative mitomycin C. However, uh, we should be prepared whenever we are using mitomycin C, we should be prepared to handle these complications, even though it's rare, but uh, it can happen. And the uh, region being a non blinding condition, uh, you you can't accept this blending the complication like this. 
and uh, this is common if you leave the sclera uh, uncovered uh, so like uh, if you are to using mitomycin c better uh, cover it with the palenctiva or amniotic membrane and uh, my uh, technique for recurrent telegenomy uh, extended resection which uh, uh, goes beyond 1 mm uh, uh, of the normal conjunctiva and uh, so I do a resection uh, all around uh, point, uh, five millimeters of the tenons was also resected all around uh, behind and beyond the uh, excised conjunctival margin. And uh, this is a conjunctival graft, which includes the limbal end of the uh, tissue. That is a small thin area of the limbal block of tissue is also included. It's a limbal conjunctival autograft. So it's an extended resection with the limbal conjunctival autograft and uh, the results are good for uh, recurrent tissue. This was published in International Journal of uh, Ophthalmology and uh, uh, our results are uh, very good with this particular technique. Coming to the causes of recurrence after conjunctival autografting, it is actually there are various factors which can cause uh, recurrence. Uh, one is the insufficient size of the graft. Uh, if you see here, uh, there is a small, small gap. There's a bare scleral defect here, and uh, the tissue is covering the other area, and this area, the lower portion, is not covered. So this can lead to oh, conjunctivalization of cornea in the bare area, and the presence of a thick graft and uh, graft retraction. These are some of the causes. There is a thick graft with the tenons in the graft. If you see the uh, result after a few months, that is, uh, it is shrunken actually. It is actually uh, retracted and uh, uh, it's irregular and gives a uh, poor cosmesis. Uh, so uh, it should be avoided. Since the limbal area is covered, uh, so it acts like a barrier and it prevents conjunctivalization. Otherwise, uh, it would have caused recurrence. And the graft inversion, if you see here, there is a sloughed of graft and uh, it's because of the necrosis of the graft. If you place the epithelial side down and the uh, stromal side up, it can lead to graft necrosis or sloughing of the graft, which can cause uh, recurrence within two months. Uh, it, causes, uh, it incites uh, significant inflammation in and around the graft and uh, can cause uh, uh, conjunctivalization uh, within two months. Usually it takes four to five months for the graft uh, recurrence to happen, but in these cases it happens within two to three months. And inadequate uh, peripheral excision, uh, you can see a small level of tissue uh, extending from the periphery. The other areas, it is all covered well. So uh, inadequate peripheral extension uh, can lead to uh, recurrence and persistent inflammation. If the eye is inflamed, it has to be treated, it has to be controlled. Otherwise, uh, it can lead to recurrence. So what are the essential factors uh, that uh, helps in the success of conjunctural autografting? One is the adequate removal of fibrovascular tissue of uh, the region. And obtaining a slightly large uh, graft, that is a large generous graft, I usually take almost a 0.5 millimeter larger graft. I use it by 0.5 millimeters in all the directions. And uh, obtaining a thin, tenons free graft is again very really important. Otherwise, it will cause a retraction of the graft. And then adequate stabilization of the graft using the glue or uh, even um, sutures or autologous blood. So wait for some time until it uh, stabilizes and uh, proper orientation of the graft. So uh, a few more uh, slides. Uh, this particular uh, technique of autologous blood is the cheap uh, method of graft fixation. So uh, anybody can try this uh, technique. Uh, the one thing is uh, you should not be placed on the clotted blood. See, if you see here, it's the clotted blood on which I'm placing the graft, it will not stay. So, oh, it is not stable when you are trimming the graft itself. You can make out uh, the graft is uh, totally unstable. It just comes off. So what you have to do is you just remove this blood clot. Uh, you allow the fresh uh, ooze to happen. I'm just uh, making a scratch marks on the base uh, clear with the sharp instrument and uh, allowing the ooze to happen. Now you place the graft and uh, uh, wait for some time. Uh, five to seven minutes and uh, move the lid over the graft so that you can uh, check the stability of the graft. Uh, so it is stable now. Another uh, technique of follow graft fixation is uh, graft edge cauterization. If you see here, uh, we've taken a uh, uh, slightly larger graft here and uh, 
going to place it on the base clear edge, uh, base clear bed. And uh, once it is placed on the base clear bed, you just uh, cauterize the edge using a bipolar cautery. Uh, it actually gives a double uh, uh, fixation. That is uh, one at the graft uh, edge. And uh, on the base clearer, you can either apply glue or you can leave uh, it on the uh, autologous blood. So you have a, a double uh, protection and uh, it stabilizes very fast. And uh, if you see, if you move the lid over the graft, uh, it is stable. There is no displacement of the graft. This works very well when you are using autologous blood. Uh, and uh, the next one, the last uh, procedure is uh, uh, graft uh, tucking in, like you can tuck the graft uh, underneath the conjunctival, at conjunctival margin. This is again uh, very important. You can uh, slightly oversize the graft by around 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters and uh, tuck it under the uh, cut conjunctival margin. And again, wait for some time. Uh, either you use the glue or you can use uh, autologous blood. And uh, uh, with the movement of the eye, the graft is stable. Uh, uh, overnight patching is important in these cases. Uh, definitely six hours of patching has to be done in these cases. To conclude, uh, uh, any dirigium procedure, uh, we have to choose the right surgical procedure. So my choice is conjunctal autografting, uh, uh, conventional conjunctal autografting for primary pterygium and uh, limbal conjunctal autografting for uh, uh, recurrent pterygium and uh, split conjunctal autografting, vertical or uh, horizontal split conjunctal autografting with or without orientation for uh, uh, double head pterygium. And the right method of graph fixation is very important. Uh, if you follow all these uh, small tips, uh, definitely you can obtain good uh, outcome. That is, uh, uh, the graph fixation will be proper and uh, uh, the recurrence chances will be less. If you do the graft in the early post operative period, the chances of recurrence will be high. So you have to choose a procedure which works well in your hands. So it is uh, fi finally the surgeon's choice and expertise that should dictate the procedure of choice in these cases. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shisha Kumar. That was a really good presentation. In the interest of time, I would suggest that we take the questions towards the end of the session. And uh, hence, I would like to invite uh, our next presenter, Dr. Gairik Kundu, who's the consultant of cornea refractive and dry eye services at Nara and Nitrale. And his talk is on tear film analysis, recent advances. Dr. Gairik. Hi, Dr. Dhanit. Thank you for the chance. Uh, thanks, Cosmo, for the chance. Mine is a pre-recorded talk. Uh, somebody from the technical team will be sharing the video, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. At the outset, I'd like to thank Coscon for giving me a chance. And uh, it's a very interesting session. I'll be speaking on tear film analysis, the recent advances. I have no financial interest. So uh, again, to reiterate the fact that, you know, uh, whatever be the diagnostics, so advanced we have gone to uh, regarding tear film analysis, nothing can obviously replace a basic evaluation. Remember history, looking at questionnaire, looking at shermers, shermers with and without anesthesia, you're looking at staining, uh, and you're looking at a clinical evaluation and grading of um, abdominal gland dysfunction and characterization. That is something which is very important. Like I said, uh, basic dry evaluation is important, and so is the role of uh, various questionnaires, including getting right to uh, you know the advances in terms of tear film analysis. I'll be dividing it into two. One is looking at uh, advanced imaging, and uh, you know the future is in molecular analysis of TFL and also customization of you know treatment for dry eye disease and using point of care diagnostic kits that is something which is very important so there are various devices and tools which indirectly help us in looking at uh, the TFL if you're looking at the lipid layer thickness which gives us an indication to uh, you know the bebomin gland functioning uh, various tools and devices if you're looking at the uh, lipid view uh, you know the oculus keratograph uh, the SPM oculus surface analyzer there are pros and cons of each one of them. Uh, also moving into advanced tear film optics analysis with the OCA, so the optical quality analysis system. So the various tools, uh, which one uh, is important or how do we interpret is what I'll be covering in uh, today. So like I said, MGD, uh, an important aspect of uh, you know 
uh, assessing the tear film is the lipid layer, which can give us a, an indication to the membrane gland functioning. Uh, anatomical characterization or you know imaging the membrane glands is equally as important. Quantifying the grade, uh, you know whether there is a, a mild loss, moderate loss, or severe gland loss. Uh, remember, majority of these devices have some amount of assessment with a normative database and aspect of artificial intelligence, which comes into the foray in this kind of as in, you know, in these kind of imaging tools. Now, the ocular surface analyzer uh, is uh, something which we also use. Uh, it gives you an assessment of meibomian glands, the meibography, which is uh, assessment of the anatomical functioning or you know how the glands are. Uh, quantifies the gland loss also gives you an option of an osdi which you can plug it in and you know and serial follow-ups look at the osdi also gives you an interesting aspect of the non-invasive breakup time uh, remember something like the tfm breakup time this is a non-invasive non -invasive assessment and uh, what it does is so it has placido rings it projects it onto the anterior surface of the cornea and it looks at you know from a blink and uh, you know how the tear film uh, you know remains stable it gives you a color coding, you know, for example, if it is green, it is that area of the cornea or the tear film is, um, you know, stable. And as soon as this tear film starts getting unstable, it changes color to, you know, mild yellow, uh, a little more darker grade of yellow and becomes red. So non-invasive breakup time, remember any tool which has a placido or placido based imaging device is uh, something where uh, non-invasive breakup time can be done. It also gives you an aspect of uh, looking at uh, like I said, the lipid layer thickness, um, it grades it based on the thickness in nanometers, uh, whether it is less than 15, which is a severe lipid layer deficiency, uh, also looks at the, you know, the patterns which you see, whether it is an open meshwork, closed meshwork, amorphous. So it gives you a pattern. It also gives you the, quantifies the thickness. And that is something which is useful. Our tear meniscus said, yeah, again, like I said, it cannot obviously replace clinical examination. And it gives you an OSDI option where you can plug in OSDI at every visit uh, and also an option for annual documentation and serial documentation of, uh, you know, uh, the staining and the staining patterns. And that is something which is inbuilt in uh, the device itself. Uh, the Cirrus keratograph, Cirrus is a topographer, which is a combination of a shine fluid device um, and a placido topographer. Like I said, a placido device will give you an on invasive breakup time. An important aspect of these devices is repeatability. Uh, you know, there have been a lot of studies which have compared uh, the reproduci reproducibility and the repeatability of the non-invasive breakup time across devices, and it was quite repeatable. Uh, lipid view, again, gives us an assessment of the lipid layer thickness. Like I spoke about LLT, which gives you both the objective assessment of the thickness and the morphology. Same way, lipid view also gives you the lipid layer thickness. Uh, it is basically an interferometric analysis, and the units with which it uses to look at the lipid layer uh, over the you know uh, the ocular surface is uh, something known as ICU or the interferometric colorimetric units. Anything which is less than 60 is considered abnormal. Uh, again, repeatability is something which you need to study in various conditions, whether it is mild, moderate, severe MGD, also normalized. So it is a fairly a very good repeatable uh, uh, device, and that is something important to remember. So, like I said, uh, anything which is less than 60 is considered as a thin lipid layer. It correlates very well with evaporative triad disease and it is a suitable screening test for detecting webomin gland dysfunction. Now, I spoke about understanding tear film optics. Now, an optical quality analysis system helps us in looking at scatter and objectively analyzing scatter of the tear film. Remember, uh, when you're looking at scatter of the tear film, uh, there are a few aspects you need to remember. In a case of an aqueous deficiency dry eye or in a case of an evaporative dry eye, no doubt the tear film or the ocular surface will be affected and that also affects the scatter which you see at the level of the preconian tail film but however in case there is also you know times where we're not able to really figure out as to why a patient is having you know some complaints of blurring of vision glare and halos and even if the tear film matrix is maybe borderline or normal tear film optics can also be you know affected so that is something which is very important and this tool helps us in objectively assessing the scatter of the preconian tail film a lot of papers which have looked at this, uh, you know, and correlating it with dry eye, something which we have also published in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, where objective scatter index correlated, had an inverse correlation with the tear film breakup time, lower is the tear film breakup time, higher is the scatter, which is uh, well understood. And, uh, you know, this device helps us in serially, you know, uh, imaging the scatter you see when the patient blinks and holds on. How you look at the scatter at, at various time intervals is something which this device looks at. 
Uh, an OSI which is more than one is considered abnormal. Uh, this is a normal line, um, and you know repeatability is again very good. And OSI which is uh, you know uh, less than one, like I said, is normal. Greater than one is abnormal. Uh, it also gives you an aspect of uh, stability of the tear film, which is known as a vision uh, breakup time, where uh, once a patient blinks, how stable the tear film is. Um, that is something which is also uh, documented with this optical quality analysis system. If you look at the scatter, you can see the scatter once the patient blinks um, and how much of scatter is present. And like I said, uh, the way of interpreting this is through an index, which is known as a mean objective scatter index. If you look at this patient, uh, you know, this patient had, uh, well, a poor tail film optics. And after applying lubricants, you can see uh, this is just to demonstrate and, uh, you know, utilizing OCAS, how we can assess even post lubricants that the tear film optics has actually improved. So repeatability, yes, it is a very repeatable device. Uh, also gives an option of a depth of focus. I won't be covering too much aspects. I've spoken an important aspect of tear film analysis, especially the mean objective scatter index on the OCAS. Now, um, what is also important is that we have assessed and looked at a lot of imaging devices and imaging tools, but a molecular analysis is also something which you need to remember when you're looking at a tear film analysis. Um, you know, I think all, many of you would be knowing about the role of tear film osmolarity, um, you know, which, uh, you know, documenting tear film osmolarity in dry eye disease, that is something which, uh, you know, many of us have uh, read a lot of number of published articles on that. Even the role of uh, various inflammatory markers, the inflama dry kit, uh, you know, serially documenting or documenting MMP9 levels. But remember, uh, you know, anything which is less than 40 nanograms levels are generally not detected and MMP9 is generally not the only thing which is deranged you know there are a lot of other markers and that is where uh, you know the role of a point of care diagnostic kit comes into the play now the future is here in terms of how we customize dry eye treatments and thereby customize and you know uh, the way we approach and analyze the tear films in terms of molecular analysis remember you're looking at dry eyes which is a uh, chronic uh, you know inflammation um, and therefore, there would be markers which are deranged and analyzing that can help us in customizing treatment better. Something like, you know, a glucometer kit, which you see, uh, you know, a point of care diagnostic kit is something which would be bedside. And remember, like I said, there are various factors which would be deranged, whether it's pro-inflammatory, pro pro-nociceptic factors or anti-inflammatory, anti-nociceptic factors. This is how the device, which is in the beta version of testing, it is known as the ILA kit, which looks at various tear soluble factors, whether it's interleukin 1, 6, 8, MMP9. It has a microfluidic channel, which is coated specifically to detect these markers. And, you know, it's an easy way to do it. Uh, this is something where clinicians can be trained, where you take out the tears uh, from the shermers, uh, you extract the tear proteins uh, using a buffer. It is then centrifuged and then uh, run on the ILA kit. And it gives you a value, which is, uh, you know, in uh, reference to a normative database. How is it helping us in customizing? This is a patient who, well, if you look at Shermers with anesthesia, was uh, deranged. Uh, tear film breakup time was well borderline. And what we found is MMP9 was elevated markedly in addition to, uh, you know, interleukin 1 levels. Uh, so remember, in this case, uh, how do we customize treatment? A, pot a potential effective treatment in this case would have been cyclosporin and an interleukin-1 antagonist, which is anakindra. Anakindra is not, uh, you know, something available. Uh, we also have studied the role of how inflammatory biomarkers decrease in cases of uh, IPL therapy. And, you know, uh, we have found that interleukin-1-6 is significantly reduced post uh, you know, an IPL with a low level light modulation therapy. And so in this patient, a cyclosporin and an IPL therapy would have really helped. So customization is the key. Imaging is obviously the way forward in addition to using molecular markers. But again, like I said, nothing can replace our conventional way of, uh, you know, assessing uh, dry eye disease. Thank you for your patient listening. That was a wonderful uh, talk, Dr. Gairik. And uh... It's very interesting to see there's so much in dry eye that is untapped. So I think it makes us all want to have a food for thought. Like I said, we'll take the questions later, but the next presentation is by Dr. Pallavi Joshi. She's the consultant cornea ocular surface and refractive surgery at Shankara Eye Hospital. And she's going to uh, present on amniotic membrane grafting in ocular surface. So ma'am, please uh, go ahead. Good morning, everybody. At the outset, I would like to thank KOS and Dr. Len Kumar for having given me this opportunity 
I would be sharing with you all today a few words about amniotic membrane transplantation in ocular surface disorders. As you all are aware that actually cornea is actually having a lot of saviors, uh, privileged immunity, a boon of vascularity, nourishing nerves and a milieu of moisture, which is provided with live stem cells. The ocular surface contributes to it by providing the tear film over it, as well as the ednix are with is protective as well as a thing which helps it to function better. Most important, the limbal stem cells, which allows it to go through all the wear and tears of day-to-day -day activities. Thus, ocular surface and the cornea are inseparable. But any kind of injury that can occur to this cornea, or for that matter, the ocular surface imbalance, either in the form of injury, will lead to ocular surface disorders. <clears throat> like chemical injuries, or it could be drug-induced interactions like Steven Johnson, or autoimmune disorders like OCPs, or a chronic inflammatory keratitis may lead to the ocular surface getting damaged, and hence the pristinity of cornea is lost, and it is in a hostile environment of a bad surface where the cornea cannot be now tamed to normal. So what does the amniotic membrane do? The amniotic membrane basically has a basement membrane which helps in the extension of native corneal epithelial cells over it. And it also has a stroma which supports the growth as well as proliferation and maintenance of the corneal stem cells, at the same time inhibiting the fibro thick tissues by the local fibroblast. It also has the anti antigenic antimicrobial activities as known. Membrane is available in different forms, either wet or dry, fresh or preserved, all are good. So where is the role of amniotic membrane in the ocular surface disorders? The first most important is acute Steven Johnson. We know that at least 25% of patients who are hospitalized need some kind of intervention because of involvement of the conjunctiva or corneal ulceration. Challenges are there because they are in the hospital. Maybe we will not have the way to examine nor the microscopes to provide us to do the ideal surgery. But these are the unideal cases where we'll have to manipulate and try to do something to give them good uh, saving of the surface. So how do we go about? Basically here, the most important thing is remove all the inflammatory debris, remove the pseudo membrane, and completely cover the ocular surface from the upper lid to lower lid with the amniotic membrane. So this helps to protect that denuded epithelium and prevents the simulacron formation. And also, as we know with its property, it provides the surface inflammation to come down. Thus, it has been known that this is very beneficial in almost all the patients it has been shown in beneficial role. And there has to be a very low threshold. We have to do it as early as possible. This is a picture of the same child whom we did a bedside bilateral AMTs and the child is doing fine. Long-term benefits are sure there when we use it at the right time. It is not just in the acute, but even in chronic Steven Johnson, the problems of surface keratinization is known to occur as well as simblephron. So here we have to make sure that the amniotic membrane is used to release the simblephron and it is being placed over the two raw areas. The amniotic membrane has to be passed through the phonix with the phonix stay sutures. Only when we take the stay suture, it is that and once the simblephron is released and the surface is covered with the amniotic membrane like a biological band, then we can provide these patients with some kind of scleral lenses, prose lens, with which they can manage a decent visual rehabilitation. So what is next? In chemical injuries, chemical injuries, patients may come with a complete acute injury or they may come after two weeks with a non-healing epithelial defect. Any chemical injury about grade three and above really require an amniotic membrane. Here it helps in preserving and expanding the slow cycle property of the epithelial stem cells. So we should not miss a chance to put amniotic membrane. So either you do it with glue or with the sutures. Most important step is de the dead tissue which is there on the surface and spreading the amniotic membrane. Most important here another step is the membrane should go all along under the surface wherever it has been totally blanched and then cover it up with a muscle hook so that it is sitting neat and fine. The upper lid and lower lid also has to be everted. We do not use here the speculum because we will not get the access to the tarsal plate. Lid sutures are very beneficial and then we apply all this and can place a confirmer in the left ring or put a tarsal suture and close it. So during acute severe form of chemical injury, this helps to provide the eye to heal and come back to near normal or at least it is preserved in case in future they go to a bad surface, there is a plane that is there between the panus and the underlying cornea. So if they come like this, obviously any kind of total limbal stem cell deficiency, whether we do cultivated cell transplants or we do a slit, amniotic membrane plays the role of providing that scaffold on which these cells grow.
So as you can see here, basically this is already after the panis is excised and on the left hand side you see the panis excision. So what is very important here is we have to make sure that the panis plane is obtained because a proper plane when it is obtained only then the corneal amniotic membrane placement and the cells to grow will be adequate. So once we obtain these cells, they are taken and placed over there with the glue um, and placed with the bandage contact lens. So amniotic membrane here helps in the growth of these cells. These islands slowly start spreading and they go and reach the palisade and re-rest there and start proliferating, providing a vascular and non uh, nicely epithelized surface. So if you go to see, um, this is how it will be after a week. So uh, the timeline of slit is beautiful. It is a nice when we do in unilateral cases. Patients really do well and they can get good vision only with this. If they are very severely scarred, we have to go with the second procedures like DALC or PK. Just to cover the and summarize the others where amniotic membranes on surface are used are in double tear regions where the graft has to be put on both the sides or where there is a recurrent tear region where there's no conjunct available or in cases of glaucoma patients in whom the conch cannot be taken, amniotic membrane plays an important role. Amniotic membrane also is used in surface oasisins like where it is basically used to cover that area uh, where we are removing the tumor. Normally primary closures are one or Placement of conjunctiva is not advisable because it's a tumor. We don't know the depth and extension. So in these cases, the amniotic membrane is used after the removal of the tumor, after the cryo excision, and then the membrane is placed over that. The only thing in these cases is that because it is cryo, the amniotic membrane sometimes get, tends to get faster absorbed and there'll be a little bit of more inflammation. So a uh, post-op good amount of steroids have to be placed for the patient. So uh, a few more like the meds, either it is the dry eye surface or it is the anesthetic corneas or post radiation like this picture in the right hand side, it's post reset. Here we're using multi-layered amniotic membrane. Uh, I prefer using glue because it does not cause the corneal astigmatism to get very distorted and patients get very good vision. So in all the melts and perforations also we use. In PUK case also, we are using it after a section to provide that scaffold healing as well as to cover up the lost tissue there where it allows the good healing. So in a few last to say about is the congenital malformations as well as dermoids. Here we have done a small dermoid excision with lamellar grafts and a focal uh, amniotic membrane. And this is a child born with cleft, cleft, cleft palate, tooth closure. Here, uh, because it's a one month old child, just use the congenital graft with amniotic membrane for the uh, fornacial formation and the child is doing fine. So thus to conclude, amniotic membrane plays a pivotal role in all surface disorders, both in Steven Johnson syndrome as well as chemical injury. In Steven Johnson, acute it helps in preventing chronic sequel whereas in chronic disease it acts as an adjuvant procedure and in chemical injuries in every stage it has a very important role and it actually can be a source for providing good vision to the patient when timely done so thank you with this i close my uh, this and i would be open for questions uh, thank you pallavi ma'am it was a an excellent presentation an amniotic membrane indeed is a boon for uh, ocular surface disorders. Uh, can I request you that if we could take the questions in the end uh, for this talk? Yeah, it's okay. And uh, we would like to move on to the next presentation, which is by Dr. M. Vanati, ma'am, uh, on corneal grafting in ocular surface disorders. Ma'am, uh, would you want to share your yeah. screen? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Pallavi, and uh, thank you, Coscon and Dr. Ellen, for making me part of this uh, wonderful session here. I think we've been uh, listening to some uh, wonderful talks uh, so far, each covering different aspects of ocular surface problems. So I'm going to be taking you through the next uh, six to seven minutes so on, uh, on the role of uh, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty in the management of uh, a few ocular surface problems here have no financial interest in the mention of any of the products during the course of my talk here. I think you have different aspects to, uh, to surgical interventions in ocular surface problems. And uh, uh, the first video here would be looking at the role of uh, uh, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty in a case of gelatinous dopris dystrophies. And this, we all know that uh, these, uh, uh, these dystrophies, this dystrophy especially, uh, does uh, produce a significant amount of ocular surface <clears throat> and discomfort, tearful disturbances here, along with visual disturbances. 
So you need to optimize the surface better with good lubri lubrication and anti-inflammatory therapy before you would take on these patients for a visual, visual rehabilitation by a lamellar procedure, an anterior lamellar procedure here. And uh, many of these corneas are definitely scarred, though it is though it is a superficial 200 to 50 micron involvement. Achieving a big bubble in these cases usually is very difficult. So as you can see in this, it's more of a, a spongy infiltration into the, uh, the, the stromal layers and not really providing a good big bubble delamination as you would like to have it if you would have done in uh, corneal ectatic disorders here. So such scenarios, a bubble does not form and you will have to resort to a, a layer by layer manual dissection uh, carefully uh, done to avoid any undue perforations here. If you have an intraopular, uh, um, intraoperative uh, OCT to guide you to the depth of involvement, it would be uh, good enough, but it's really not always uh, a mandatory that you need this for, uh, for your surgeries. I think most of us are experienced enough to do it without the need of an IOCT incorporated microscope here. So you could go on with a manual dissection up to the depth of involvement or do a deep anterior lamellar dissection and put in the donor corneal button here and suture it into position here. This is a therapeutic grade, uh, uh, non-optical grade uh, donor cornea sutured onto the uh, host bed after resection of the affected tissue here. Do remember that uh, there is a high recurrence of uh, uh, of gelatinous uh, droplets dystrophy in these patients here, most of their uh, visual acuities does become uh, a suboptimal and getting a 618, 612 is uh, perhaps uh, quite challenging uh, in these cases here. Yeah, I can hear a lot of background noise in this. I'm so sorry about it. Um, Uh, Shashanka, can you mute everyone, please? Uh, yes, ma'am, I, I just did. Okay. Ma'am. Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, this is a case of uh, chemical injury. Uh, a child who had, under, uh, had undergone uh, two surface optimizations with amniotic membrane reconstructions with simplifron, following a simplifron lysis here, and a, 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 a simple limbal epithelial transplantation. And three months later, this is how the surface looked at, looked like with the uh, differential corneal thinning. The limbus was uh, relatively uh, better reconstructed. You could find the, uh, uh, the, the disrupted palisades of wound following a select reconstruction here. The cornea has variable thickness here. It's a thin cornea here and with significant haze. And we decided to take the patient on for a deep anterior lamellar uh, keratoplasty for visual rehabilitation of this patient here. Again, these patients are going to require continued therapy with lubricants and uh, surface immunosuppressants uh, to control the uh, topical uh, the, the ocular surface inflammation here. Again, remember a big bubble is not a preferred choice in these patients and a good topography evaluation or a good slip lamp evaluation to be aware of the layers which are thinned out. Uh, a very, uh, very meticulous layer by layer dissection is uh, imperative in these patients and then put on the donor cornea and suture it on. Uh, the visual acuity in these patients, uh, which, which they achieve is uh, quite good, can go up to 618, 612 or 69 in cases with lesser, uh, uh, lesser opacifications, lesser morbidities. But do remember these lamellar grafts um, can have problems of, uh, of recurrent infections here. And uh, there could be a surface conjunctivalization, which does start occurring on in the, in the later periods, uh, maybe two, three years down the line here. Yeah. So that's another scenario of an ocular surface uh, uh, problem here. The, the last one here is what you would see commonly in the North Indian uh, setups of uh, trachomatis keratopathy affected uh, corneas affected with uh, severe seculase of trachomatis keratopathy. This we commonly see in patients who come to us for uh, cataract surgeries. These are elderly patients here with a bad anterior cornea here. And after optimizing their surfaces for their dry eye component, uh, could take them on for a lamellar procedure before you would decide to do a cataract surgery. 
the options are to plan a simultaneous uh, cataract surgery as well when you're doing a deep anterior lamellar for these patients once you do take off or uh, or lamellar dissect the anterior superficial layers here you could plan a cataract surgery through the the clearer deeper layers of the cornea here but um, uh, for the difficulty of uh, of the planning of optimal uh, IOL power calculations, I always do prefer to take them on subsequently after I do my uh, deep anterior lamellar procedures for trachomatous keratopathy here. And uh, these cases do pretty well here. And sometimes they are mature cataracts or near mature cataracts, which do come to us here. Optimizing the surface for better visualization with the deep anterior lamellar procedures. And if your corneal thickness is uniform enough and, and permits uh, uh, an ALTK, that also works fine in these cases as well. So you could do an automated lamellar as well and subsequently plan your cataract surgeries down the line uh, later on. So these are uh, a couple of uh, varied scenarios of ocular surface disorders where uh, you use deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty to the best use. I have uh, have not ventured into the roles of penetrating keratoplasties for ocular surface uh, uh, disorders here. Probably we look at it at a, at a different uh, session with uh, with the time allotted. And thanks again, many thanks to Coscon and uh, Dr. Ellen for making me part of this uh, fantastic session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vanati. Um, since Dr. Vanati has to be present for another session in some time. Uh, if anybody has any questions or any um, thing to ask, to okay, I think uh, we can have a you know, like discussion for the topics which are presented uh, till now. Let's uh, keep for topics we have covered and uh, we can have discussion for this. Uh, topic. Yes, we can do that. We have time. Maybe for 10 minutes, we can have a discussion. Uh, sure, topic. sure. So I would invite uh, anybody who wants to have any. Uh, who has any questions for any of our speakers from Terigium to dry eye to AMG and to corneal transplants in uh, ocular surface disorder? Uh, I have questions uh, to Eric. Uh, you're there, uh, Mary? Yes, sir, I'm here. Uh, yeah, no, this is like a, it's a very nice presentation. Like you have covered all the latest aspects of. Uh, all these uh, diagnostic tests, uh, like uh, how practical it is, like uh, by just uh, checking the osmolarity, because we know there is hyperosmolarity in dry conditions and uh, the MMP levels are high. So we are going to give them a, a formulation which uh, contains all these uh, osmotic uh, protectants and uh, 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 like viscosity agents, all those things. You know, like uh, how practical it is, like uh, uh, making a diagnosis of hyperosmolarity because hyperosmolarity is commonly seen in all the dry eye. Yeah, so I wanted to bring in the concept of how molecular markers came into being. I'm not saying uh, osmolarity is the only thing we look at. What I spoke towards the end was on a point of care diagnostic kit. So uh, our initial understanding of molecular marker analysis was maybe you're just looking at an MMP9, but that's not the way forward. You need to, there are so many markers in various combinations. So the, the crux of the matter is even uh, two patients who have the same TFL metrics might not behave the same way. And that's where mm -hmm. molecular and uh, you know, the role of a customized approach you know, I spoke about a case where a patient had an MMP9 being elevated and interleukin 1, interleukin 6. So, customized treatments for this is the way forward. Uh, on the role of osmolarity, no doubt, hyperosmolarity will uh, invariably be present. Uh, even MMP9 kits, uh, there have been a lot of, uh, you know, cons, uh, you know, which have shown, I mean, rather, you know, people have shown issues regarding just looking at MMP9 in patients with dry eyes. So that is where I wanted to bring in the role of uh, looking at multiple markers. Uh, and that kit, which is the LR kit, is still in the beta version testing now. And uh, costing is something which everybody would be asking about. But gradually, as and when it, it does come out, uh, costing is something which can be sorted out. Can I just say a few words on this? Yes. yes yeah. yeah, I think that was a fantastic presentation. Uh, by Dr. Kundu, and I think uh, what he aimed at was to show the uh, the entire portfolio which is available uh, for investigating a dry eye disease here. And as we all know, the uh, the alma alma mater consists of uh, uh, 
uh, uh, lots of uh, cytokines and matrix metalloproteinases, which are raised in several dry eye pathologies. There is an overlap of the type of, of MMPs and cytokines, interleukins, which are raised uh, between the various ocular surface disorders. To, to sort of customize your inflammatory therapy to decrease one particular cytokine or an interleukin or an MMP is going to be uh, really difficult. And what most of the anti-inflammatory therapies do is to, on, on, on a larger basis, decrease most of these inflammatory molecular mediators. That said, hyperosmolarity in today's, I think the latest perceptions is not considered. Looking at the osmolarity is perhaps now not considered uh, a real requisite or a real representation of a dry eye management, except for when you're looking at particular cases like patients who are going in for cataract surgery and are on, uh, on chronic anti-glaucoma therapies, patients on severe dry eye disease, where you're probably going to monitor the, the level of postoperative therapies which are going to be required. For there are particular indications we do look at. Now, I do agree, looking at these inflammatory markers and when you're using the Shermer strip, for extraction of these tears is going to be quite laborious, needs to be done very meticulously. And uh, we do look at uh, a lot of kits, a lot of variety of kits are available for, um, on, for looking at these, uh, uh, as looking at the values of these uh, managers. But still, what is the exact role on these inflammatory mediators, how these markers vary on the surface is uh, something which uh, research is still looking into. Um, ma I had a I, yeah, well, just one thing I wanted to confirm with Dr. Kundu. I think you mentioned um, uh, the objective uh, scatter index, but yes, uh, your slides wrote it down as ocular scatter index. Which of the two is no, right? it is an objective, objective scatter yeah. Index. So that's why I, I think uh, your slide mentioned as an ocular yeah. scatter yeah. index, yeah, whatever I mean, there might have been, yeah, there. Okay. Okay. For that. but yeah, it's an objective scatter yeah. index. Sure. So ma'am, uh, I had a question for you. Um, there's always this uh, debate about simultaneous uh, surface with keratoplasty versus sequential um, surface procedures with keratoplasty. So which is the one that you prefer and are there any situations where you would make an exception? Uh, I, I think you mean uh, whether we do a simplifron lysis uh, with a, a, a anterior lamella keratoplasty or you would do it in separate. So when you're looking at um, a chemical injury, then uh, it, again, it looks at the, it, it depends on the stage at which you're looking at. Whenever I look at an acute chemical injury, I do agree with Dr. Pallavi Joshi, I'm going to uh, use all my resources to optimize the surface. You do not want the, the inflammation and the fibrosis component to go on to a larger, uh, larger heights here. So here it is surface reconstruction primarily, which is going to take the, the front row here. And you would look at options for ocular surface reconstruction. Once you've been able to reconstruct the ocular surface successfully, that said by simplifron lysis, amniotic membrane, mucous membrane, depending upon the depth of the furnaces involved and the available amount of, of uh, mucous membrane tissue, which is there with you on the ocular surface, you subsequently follow it up by a uh, limbal re uh, rehabilitation using a select procedure, uh, or you want to take a, a, a cultivated uh, a limbal epithelium. That depends upon whether it's a unilateral injury or a bilateral injury, and the amount of surface destruction is there. And I generally believe uh, the select procedure is well done, or uh, the success outcome is well is good once you are able to control the surface inflammation following optimal. Otherwise, you do compromise the successes of your CLET or your SLEC procedures. And once you've been able to, even the story doesn't end here, you probably will need a three to six months to optimize these surfaces further with medical therapy before you would venture in for visual rehabilitation. Even you're going to do a, a procedure such as an anterior lamellar procedure, or you want to do a penetrating keratoplasty, or you're looking at a keratoprocess. The success and the, and the long-term outcome is still better if you do it in a sequential. Until and unless you are looking at a corneal melt in an acute stage where you are forced to do a tectonic procedure, and some do combine their slets and clets along with that, but uh, only time will tell whether this really helps and it is a case-to-case -case basis. Uh,
you I think you have the luxury of using the interoperative OCT uh, for your cases, uh, but uh, not many of us have that. Uh, so, like uh, when you encounter a type two or a type three bubble, uh, do you bother with the uh, manual dissection and do cases, or uh, do you try to collapse bubble and uh, do the dissection? See, when your bubble is well achieved, then uh, then I do not do a manual dissection. I think earlier teachings is uh, we used to do one layer of anterior lamellar dissection, even when the bubble is in. And then you would uh, you would burst out your bubble or you de-roof the big bubble chamber here. So once you were able to achieve, nowadays I do not go ahead with, uh, uh, with an initial anterior lamellar dissection here. That said, uh, I think uh, we've also got more experience and we are... Uh, we are able to do our, uh, our dissections faster. But if you're a beginner and if you're going to have the bubble in with a taut chamber for a long period of time and your dissections are going to be slower, beware that you could land up with a urex cephalia here. And uh, I'm not a very strong uh, or a very favorite um, promoter of uh, patron of the IOCT. I do many of my surgeries without the IOCT and I still feel it's just a luxury uh, which you would, it looks nice on presenting, but it's not really mandatory. I think it's the feel and uh, knowing at what depth you're operating, which is more important rather than looking up at your ISO IOCT all the time. <laughs> One question to Dr. Pallavi. Like, uh, uh, it's a nice presentation. You have given uh, various case examples. Uh, human, uh, the preserved amniotic membrane is, uh, of course, uh, is available to only uh, selected uh, uh, surgeons. Uh, but uh, this, uh, like, gas sterilized, dry, available Can you just tell us the difference between these uh, two or, uh, or both the same? It was not very clear your last part. Can you please repeat? No, like a dry amniotic membrane, which is available in the market now. Like yes. We are using that dry AMG, which is a gas sterilized uh, amniotic membrane, which is available in the market. And uh, the, the preserved uh, human amniotic membrane is available only to a few institutes, not available to all of us. Uh, so, uh, what is the difference in the outcome? Is it the same outcome or something different? Uh, um, there are two things. One, uh, I have uh, only used a couple of times the dry MP. Uh, the dry MP actually comes in a limited size. And uh, the pliability of a dry MP on the surface, as far as what I have uh, been using, is comparatively less than when we use the wet or the one in the dulbacos media. So uh, when you need a very large surface area, like you need to cover the whole fornix, the surface, as well as the cornea, the wet is a better option. When you have to do on the cornea, like small perforations or, you know, only the, this, the dry is nearly the same. Otherwise, uh, the main thing is the handling and the marking which is there on the dry, which have to, the orientation has to be kept because there you cannot feel that one we feel in the wet. In the wet, we can actually very well make out which is the basement end and which is the stromal side. In dry, we have to be very particular to look at the orientation. These are the two things which come to my mind, sir. Any experience with the Procara, Dr. Pallavi? Uh, no, no, madam. I have not used Procara. Okay. So, Again, I think uh, a, a word of, uh, just a word of advice is for those uh, beginners who are into cornea is um, doing an amniotic membrane uh, reconstruction for the ocular surface helps when you're looking at uh, the, uh, the type of squamous failure which you're there. So if you're having a lot of surface keratinization, a simple AMG, uh, I do see a lot of beginners using an AMG for, uh, for keratinization of the ocular surface. It usually does not work well and you will have to look at a, a mucous membrane grafts for these patients here. So an amniotic membrane works well when you're looking at a squamous failure like for a post-chemical injury when uh, and you do not have a keratinization on the ocular surfaces. That's something, the concepts of ocular surface failures and how you reconstruct them and understanding them is very imperative in the long-term success of these deconstructive procedures. That's a very good point, ma'am. Um, can we, should we move to our uh, next speaker? Our next speaker is Dr. Sharon D'Souza. She's a consultant, cornea, phaco refractive, and ocular surface at Narayan Mitrale. And her talk is on topical immunomodulators and corneal disorders. Dr. Sharon? Uh, Ma'am, I'll play the video right now. Please play. 
At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers of the KOS conference for inviting me to give this talk. Today, I'll be speaking on topical immunomodulated therapy in corneal diseases. So we do know that immune mediated diseases often require long term therapy with both topical and systemic steroids, which can be associated with systemic side effects. In the immune mediated diseases of the eye, again, topical corticosteroids do play an important role. Uh, and over time, if used without care or overused, abused, uh, they can lead to cataract and glaucoma. Topical strategies of immunomodulatory therapy, the non-steroidal ones, bear the possibility and help us to circumvent these severe side effects because of their steroid sparing role. So a number of conditions can be associated and can uh, be benefited by the topical immunomodulatory therapy. The most common which we see in our OPD are dry eye, ocular allergy, which may or may not be associated with systemic allergies, uh, superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis, other conditions like uh, post-PRK haze or connective tissue disorders, very importantly, uh, when they're associated with conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or SLE. So before we get into the therapy of it, it's very important that we understand the immunology of the cornea. And this is a, a diagrammatic uh, representation. And what we need to remember is that the immunoglobulins reach the central cornea by diffusion from the limbus. Cytokines like interferon gamma or interleukin-1 stimulate the epithelial cells to express the MHC2, which is very integral to uh, the immunomodulatory process. Uh, the MHC1 is expressed by the epithelial cells, keratocytes, and endothelial cells. So our cornea itself has a huge immunomodulatory potential. And antigen-presenting cells uh, uh, move from the periphery to the center and they can be activated to express the MH2 as well. So the local mechanisms of the immune response related to the afferent limb are various potential targets which we can then use to uh, uh, help these conditions. So the main ones here in among all these different mechanisms is one is the induction of the MHC2 expression in the central cornea by the pro-inflammatory cytokines like interferon and the centripetal migration of the antigen-presenting cells under the influence of the tnf -alpha. When we look at the various pharmacokinetic aspects, which are also very important in these medications, we have to remember that certain chemical or physical properties of the drug preparations influence how they penetrate the cornea or are attached on the ocular surface, which includes their molecular weight, whether they are hydrophilic or lipophilic, the pH, the osmolarity, and viscosity. Many of these uh, drugs which are available to us have a very poor water solubility because they are lipophilic in nature and therefore need to have a complex reagent or a vehicle which uh, then allows them to remain on the surface for longer. The enhanced solubility of the lipophilic drugs is uh, therefore achieved by complexation with, condition, with con certain uh, cyclodextrins, liposomes or chitosan nanoparticles. Uh, which are these medications that we keep talking about? So uh, two of the most common ones that we have available to us are cyclosporin A and tacrolimus, and that's what I'll be talking about in most of my talk. So cyclosporin A is a macrolide antibiotic. <clears throat> we know it's used in systemic conditions. Um, it's isolated from a soil fungus, and it is lipophilic in nature. Um, just to very briefly talk about mechanism of action. So if you look here at the red box, you see that is cyclosporin A which then binds to cyclophilin and forms a complex, uh, the cyclocalcineurin. Um, this blocks the function of the calcineurin. So how this acts is that it prevents the dephosphorylation of the activated T cells. And those activated T cells are actually very important uh, as a promoter of the interleukin-2 gene, which initiates the interleukin-2 production. So hence the cyclosporin A prevents the T cells from producing interleukin-2 and thereby a full T cell activation. And we know that interleukin-2 is very important in our immune function. So the drug delivery or the ocular delivery of cyclosporin A can be through various formulations, which in the form of gel, solution, suspensions. But what are commercially available to us in uh, India is a concentration of 0 0.05, 0 0.1, and 2%. Abroad, there are even 1% uh, concentrations available. And this is also available in multi-dose vials or single-use UNIMS as uh, 
powder is available. So um, usually for a patient with dry eye, the more common present, uh, percentage that we use is cyclosporin 0.05% or 0.1% in a twice daily dosage. And because they are very uh, slow acting in their onset of action, um, it is usually given for at least three to six months. Um, obviously, other adjunct medications like the lubricants and gels are, have to be continued. The limitation is that um, because of its high lipophilicity, um, it does not have a very good penetration into the air. So that we must remember. And of course, uh, it's very important when we're prescribing these medications to uh, tell the patient that there may be certain burning sensation, stinging sensation, otherwise they will believe it to be a complication of the medication and stop it. Um, we can also prepare a 1% cyclosporin medication, which is very useful in patients who have severe ocular allergy where the lower concentrations are not effective. And this can be present, uh, prepared from the injectable forms of cyclosporin with artificial tears. Um, into a 1% cyclosporin eye drops. Of course, this is more cumbersome than the commercially available medications, but uh, they are very useful in these uh, conditions with severe allergy. There are also certain... Uh, the sound is gone, Mr. Shishan. Also a slightly higher concentration. So it is an oil and water solution, and that's what helps uh, and improves its hydrophilic properties. The next drug we talk about is tacrolimus, which is an antibiotic. Uh, isolated from streptomyces, and uh, it is used systemically again, but <clears throat> in the topical form, it has been found to be very, very useful. Now, again, it's a hydrophobic uh, molecule, so at um, in aqueous solution, it's unstable, so again, it needs a vehicle. Um, Tacrolimus encapsulated in cyclodextrin has been found to help even in cases of corneal allograft ejections. Um, other vehicles which have been used are liposomes. And because both these medications have a very low blood concentration in the topical administration, so um, the safety is extremely good. The mechanism of action, I won't go into too much detail, but uh, what we must remember is that it blocks the early T cell activation and also impairs the prostaglandin synthesis and suppresses histamine release. <clears throat> and all these three actions together reduce the allergic symptoms. So it's extremely useful in patients with severe ocular allergy. The dose available to us is 0.03 and 0.1% acrylimus eye ointment. It's uh, usually given as a night dosage or twice a day. Um, again, even with this medication, there can be certain burning, stinging, uh, soreness of the eyes. And it's important to tell them to put extremely uh, little into the eye, like a rice grain amount, um, and not to overuse it because then the burning may be too much. When we compare uh, both of them, uh, we do know that acrylimus is much more potent um, than cyclosporin. So we would assume that it would be a little more effective, but uh, at uh, the various concentrations, they each have their distinct uses. <clears throat> so when we look at the immune response to various conditions, especially in allergy, we find that um, certain medications act at various points, and it's important to understand that. So for example, the mast cell stabilizers prevent the degranulation of the mast cells. Um, cyclosporin acts against, it's a T cell inhibitor, blocks the transcription of the cytokine genes in activated T cells. Um, so this way we would try to, you know, give a more targeted therapy. So to bring it a little closer to home, I just thought I'd bring these clinical cases. And this was a 12 year old boy with severe VKC, and you can see the giant papillae and the shield ulcer in the eye. Um, uh, this patient, uh, of course, required uh, topical steroids, also a supratarsal steroid injection, but what actually broke that cycle of needing the repeated steroids was the trichrolimus in this child. And over time, this is how they regress and improve. Uh, it's important to explain to them at the beginning about the long-term therapy required, and these medications would need to be used for very long. Another use uh, of this very commonly is patients with severe dry eye, especially uh, if they have any underlying systemic condition. And you can see this is a secondary Sjogren's with rheumatoid arthritis. And in addition to our lubricants and gels, it's important to put them on an immunomodulatory therapy systemic, uh, topically. And if they have an underlying uh, systemic condition, they would also require a systemic therapy. But uh, in this case, cyclosporin 0.05% or 0.1% is what would be. Uh, very useful and they do do well over time. 
So we have done a lot of research work on the uh, immune uh, changes on the ocular surface and recently published this paper in the Ocular Surface Journal, uh, where you can see that there is a distinct immuno uh, cell profile which we see in dry eye disease. And we have also shown this in keratoconus. Now, why this is important uh, is that once we know what is the uh, molecular changes, the inflammatory changes, the cellular changes on the ocular surface, we can try and give a much more targeted therapy rather than a blanket steroid or anti-inflammatory. And uh, we have done extensive work on different ocular surface conditions. So again, to try and explain that a little better, we know that in dry eye disease, um, there is a lot of changes where the neutrophils uh, increase, the T helper cells increase, the dendritic cells increase, all because of the inflammatory milieu. And we can actually have different medications which act at different points. For example, lifetigrass uh, can act you know, directly on inhibiting the dendritic cells and T cell uh, you know, area. So this targeted therapy is what we are trying to achieve over time with our immunomodulated therapy. So the newer innovations that we have now in, uh, is to try and detect these inflammatory markers. And we have a microfluidic device, which is now um, uh, you know, getting uh, more and more available to us, where we can detect the various tear soluble factors um, rather than just one or two, you can have an entire panel of it. And how this would help is that once you know which are the markers which are elevated or altered, you can then direct your therapy directly to it so you you know whether you know you use need to use uh, cyclosporin or lifticrast or add in doxycycline and that would probably be the way to go in the future so the take home point is that topical immunomodulatory therapy is very useful in a lot of different ocular surface disease you must remember that it is an adjunct therapy but it can be used for extended durations with limited side effects and newer medications more customization and targeted therapy is probably the future Thank you very much for a patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Sharon. That was an excellent presentation. Um, topical immunomodulators, we know we have one or two options and we try to just use them, but like you said, targeted therapy is very useful. We'll take your questions uh, after the last two presentations. Uh, the next presentation is by Dr. Aniket Shastri who's a consultant cornea for refractive services at M.M. Joshi Hospital, Hubli. And his presentation is on simple limbal epithelial transplantation, which we all know as LET. So, um, yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll be speaking today about uh, simple limbal epithelial transplant, otherwise called as LET. Uh, we all know that uh, the limbal stem cells are important for uh, newly generated uh, corneal epithelial cells and uh, any kind of severe trauma or inflammation of the limbus may actually lead to damage of these limbal stem cells and thereby cause uh, corneal epithelial dysfunction. Uh, this state of limbal stem cell deficiency is in fact characterized by invasion of uh, irregular and thickened uh, conjunctiva conjunctival epithelium sorry, onto the corneal surface resulting in loss of corneal clarity and in severe cases and chronic cases limbal stem cell deficiency uh, can lead to visual impairment and even uh, blindness. Uh, the etiology basically ranges from hereditary to acquired uh, that can lead to either partial or total limb st uh, limbal stem cell deficiency either in one eye or uh, both the eyes. Uh, chemical and thermal burns in fact leads uh, the etiology in our uh, clinical practice. Uh, fortunately, limbal stem cell transplant as such can reverse this potentially blinding condition by uh, transferring the healthy limbal tissue that contains the limbal stem cells from a normal donor eye. This donor eye could be the other eye of the patient or it could be another individual as such. Uh, depending on that, it can either be autologous or allogenic respectively. If it's from another person, it's allogenic. Uh, when you want to transplant, you can either transplant only the limbal stem cells or you can transplant the limbal stem cells along with the conjunctiva. Earlier, we used to do uh, conjunctival limbal autografts and allo conjunctival limbal allografts where we used to transfer limbal stem cells along with the uh, 3 to 4 mm of conjunctiva. This whole unit used to be around 3 to 3 clock hours on either side from uh, superiorly and inferiorly from the donor eye. And uh, just like I told you, if it is from a... Uh, other eye, it is called as conjunctival limbal autograph. If it is from a, another person, it is conjunctival limbal 
uh, allograft. The only problem here is because you are taking around six clock hours from the donor area, there is a chance of causing iatrogenic limbal stem cell deficiency. Uh, when we transplant limbal stem cells only is the one, uh, if it is from the other eye uh, of the same person, of the other, other eye of the individual, it's called as autoslet or it can be called as allosled if you're taking it from a relative or another donor. Uh, limbal stem cell can also be cultivated in your uh, laboratories, which is called as cultivated limbal epithelial transfer and then transplanted uh, onto the recipient eye. But the problem here is it's <clears throat> uh, the cost and also the maintenance of those labs and also the government criteria, which has become very strict now. Uh, another thing is you can use uh, cadaveric uh, eyes less than 48 hours fresh with intact uh, limbus and epithelium and that's when uh, we call it as uh, keratolimbal uh, allograft. Uh, keratolimbal allograft and uh, alloslet and uh, conjunctival limbal allograft as such because it's from other individuals, the, there's a chance of rejection and it uh, needs uh, immunosuppression in such cases. A simple limbal epithelial transplant as such or slet <clears throat> combines the benefits of the conjunctival limbal autograft and cultivated limbal epithelial transplant. It's a single stage procedure and uh, cost effective. Uh, biopsy uh, from the, what, what we usually do is, with this is a donor eye, we take around three to uh, four millimeter of the limbus. The limbal stem cells are uh, taken and preserved in BSS in the recipient eye. We clear off the panus, uh, then we place an amniotic membrane over this uh, dissected area. And then off, over the uh, amniotic membrane, we use these uh, limbal stem cells which cut into around eight to 10 pieces and placed in the mid periphery. And over that, we put a bandage concentrate. This is basically what is called as the slit. <clears throat> so when it comes to indication, an ideal indication would be an unilateral limbal stem cell deficiency, uh, which helps in autologous slit. Uh, any kind of limbal stem cell deficiency secondary to uh, OSSN or a multiple surgical interventions, primary and recurrent erygia that leads to uh, 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 limbal stem cell deficiency. And uh, in case of bilateral, we would need an allogenic sled. Uh, when it comes to the donor in autologous sled, superior limbus is usually preferred as the palisades are more in number there. Uh, in a cadaveric slit, like I told you, an intact uh, limbal palisades, no epithelial sloughing, less than uh, 48 hours, and an uh, age of 60 or less. These are the ideal cases if someone wants to start, it should be a unilateral total limbal stem cell deficiency. A wet ocular surface, a dry surface will not support your transplant. There should be no eyelid pathologies, no uh, lack of thalmos, entropion, ectropion, trichiasis, symblephron, a minimal symblephron and a relatively clear corneal stroma, which can be diagnosed with an antrasegment OCT. If the symblephron is large, then only slit may not help, and you will have to add a conjunctival autograft along with slit. And in cases of partial limbal stem cell deficiency, large pterygiums, wired pterygiums, it can be managed with a conjunctival autograft. There is no need of slit in such cases. Whenever there is dry ocular surface, blind eye, disorganized anterior segment, lead pathology, these are the cases that are absolute contraindication for slit. You may have to consider other procedures. The role of OCT, I told you, it gives you two informations as to what the thickness of the underlying stroma is. So that helps you plan the dissection. If it is a thin area that needs to be avoided, a perforation can be avoided in such place. It gives an infrared image by that. The clarity of here is going to depict how the stromal clarity is. If you are able to appreciate some of the pupil and the iris details, that means uh, this is going to give you good results as the stroma is relatively better underneath. Coming to the surgery as such, this is from the donor, uh, donor side. Uh, the limbus is usually around 3 to 4 mm is required. We don't use a marker pen because it contains alcohol and can damage the stem cells there. Uh, one clock hour around 3 to 4 mm is marked and then uh, limbus based uh, Flap is created and this limbus based crap dissection is supratenance or subconjunctival. And uh, we continue it anteriorly uh, till we reach the limbal area here. I use some amount of brimonidine actually to help in uh, prevention of bleeding. And this bleeding here cannot be prevented. Uh, this is because of the vascular supply of the limbal cells here. Once you reach there, then you can use a 15 number blade, go as parallel as possible as flat as possible and continue your dissection anteriorly. And once you reach uh, here, this is what I want to show you, this gray line, this is when you're reaching into the stroma. 
that is where your dissection stops so you can help tell your assistant to keep on uh, irrigating it so that uh, these vessels don't uh, obstruct your field and then i'll pause this again if you see this this is your conjunctiva this gray line is the stroma that is there and this in between shining part is the limbus stem cells which are going to use for uh, uh, transplant and uh, once that is that, we can cut the conjunctive off. You can use the same conjunctive if you are planning a conjunctival autograft, combining with the sled. And once that is done, you can use a, to a non tooth forceps so that you don't damage the limbal stem cells and the sharp vanas to uh, procure the four millimeters of limbus. Then, when it comes to the surgery proper, Any kind of uh, large simblephron here has to be dissected. It helps you in putting a speculum. Uh, and uh, a 3 to 4 mm dissection is what is important <clears throat> around the limbus. We have just marked it with a trifine. It's a blunt trifine. And with a blunt uh, crescent, we are creating a dissection. Once this plane is reached, then you can use the blunt instruments to 360 degree in the uh, periphery to create a plane, relieve it from the limbus, and then come centripetally onto the center of the eye because if you try to sometimes come to the center of the eye it becomes thinner there can be perforation periphery is always thicker it also helps in dissecting the panis easily once the whole uh, panis is dissected uh, from the whole 360 degree uh, this is something uh, uh, this the, this tissue this is a scar tissue that is usually available present at the limbus and that scar tissue has to be taken out otherwise it's called a bad gutter and scar and uh, once that is done, we use a fibrin glue and place an AMT. And uh, once AMT is placed, uh, try to sweep as much as possible and tuck this AMT under this conjunctival dissection, which we have done. This uh, takes out any of the excess fibrin glue. And uh, then we place the cells, nimble stem cells, and, uh, so save, uh, and put a BCL. This is a similar case, another case. Uh, post operative is. Uh, Topical uh, antibiotics, you have a prednisolone state for six weeks, tear substitute, BCL can be removed after one week and check for any epithelial defect. Uh, topical cyclosporin in case of haze and you, need, you may need immunosuppressants if it is an alloslet. And this is a one of follow up of the same case which we are discussing there. There's a mild scar there, but not in the pupillary region. The person is quite happy and realistic. Uh, role of AMT, we need to know that in uh, acute stage, it controls inflammation and provides a stable surface actually for us in future. Uh, already, uh, if you put an AMT in acute stage, uh, there will be easier handling during transplantation. Uh, these are some of the reasons for failure. Presence of simblephron, keratoplasty, any hemorrhage under the AM, loss of contact lens, uh, any kind of perforation during surgery. Acid burns are associated with more lid abnormality, therefore more associated with failure. Uh, and the advent of slet as such has made life significantly easier for us corneal surgeons, particularly in the developing world. Uh, this technique can actually be as an easy learning curve and uh, an inexperienced surgeon as well uh, can replicate the similar results. So, thank you. So it was then. Yeah, the next topic is by Dr. Rolling. And it's an always the same presentation than many. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Shishanka, can you play the video, please? Oh, sure, ma'am, sure. Good evening, everyone. At the outset, I would first like to congratulate the Scientific Committee of Coscon for this academic extravaganza. Um, I would also like to thank Dr. Ellen Kumar for giving me this opportunity of sharing my experience of OSSN with you guys. I'm going to share my screen now. I'm going to be talking about the clinical presentation and management of OSSN. Uh, OSSN is basically ocular surface squamous neoplasia. It includes various epithelial surface neoplasias like dysplasias of various grade, carcinoma in situ, squamous cell carcinoma. And it can present as various uh, a gamut of um, clinical pictures like epithelial plaque, intraepithelial epithelioma, dyskeratosis, dysplasia or Bowen's disease. 
In etiopathogenesis, basically uh, the limbal stem cells when exposed to mutagenic agents have an altered expression of MMB1 and 3, which leads to a DNA damage which is inherited in the cell cycle, resulting in the carcinogenic effect. Uh, viral infections can also get integrated um, integrated in the DNA, the genetic material of the virus, causing the cell cycle damage. The risk factors or the mutagenic agents include UV radiation, chemical carcinogens, viral infections, especially uh, HIV, H. PV. Um, Age-wise, I think it is more common in elderly age group. Uh, Gender-wise, uh, the epidemiology says that males are more affected than females probably because of the outdoor work. And uh, certain conditions like xeroderma pigmentosum, which is an autosomal recessive disease, can also lead to um, OS, uh, more frequent OSSN, especially in younger age as well. Uh, xeroderma pigmentosum is an autosomal recessive disorder where the uh, enzyme NER is absent, which inhibits the repair, DNA repair caused by the UV radiation. Now, as a clinical picture, the patient typically presents uh, with the complaints of redness, irritation, watering, and also photophobia. Uh, some patients may present as a mass-like lesion, uh, straightforward. Typically, uh, these lesions are present in the interpalpebral and peri perilimbal area. They can be present as a leukoplakic lesion. Feeder vessels are very important to identify, and these are the vessels which give you the first clue that this and certain tumors are infiltrative, which can infiltrate the underlying structures like sclera, sclera. sclera. Uh, Mucoepidermoid and spindle cell carcinomas can also be found. In an atypical presentation, there can be massive surface tumors along with scleral necrosis. The slide shows a variety of lesions that we see we have seen in our OPD. The first slide is a conjunctival. Uh, uh, ranging from the conjunctival papillomatous lesion to leukoplakic lesion to even just purely corneal uh, OSSN where you can see a sheet of translucent um, cells on the top of the cornea. Um, the last picture is of a very severe papillomatous uh, OSSN with huge uh, feeder vessels. This was a case with uh, who had HIV. So these cases are very severe and they progress very rapidly. Uh, from an investigation point of view, the gold standard is histopathology. It could be incisional or excisional. Impression cytology is a very good tool these days, which can give us a relatively non-invasive um, diagnosis. And uh, it is good to diagnose carcinoma in C2 or dysplastic cells. However, it is less sensitive for squamous cell carcinoma. Anterior segment OCT can also be used, which uh, shows hyperreflectivity on the epithelial layer, which is basically the dysplastic cells, as well as an um, abrupt um, ending and an acute angle between the lesion as well as the um, normal cornea. It can also be used to assess the depth of the infiltration. Epigenetics can be done in cases like xeroderma pigmentosa. As a treatment of choice, white surgical excision with no touch technique, no also known as shields technique, is something that is advocated. Uh, adding on to this excision, cryotherapy can be done to the base as well as the edges of the lesion. Uh, as a part of a um, surface pairing or so to save the surface, um, more so microsurgical technique can be done to reduce the tissue uh, loss. Uh, topical chemotherapy with MMC 0.02 or 0.4 percent or 5 uracil can be done. Immunotherapy is also useful these days in patients who cannot tolerate the chemotherapy um, with interferon alpha 2b. Prognosis-wise, the recurrence rate for local lesions is 5% if the lymph node metastasis is there. Then uh, usually it is not very common, less than 2%. Uh, increased risk of recurrence in immunocompromised patients who can also get aggressive variants like mucoepidermoid and 
spindle cell carcinoma. There is also an increased risk of recurrence in patients with ceridoma pigmentosa. Now I'm presenting um, a case to you with a 65 year old man who presented with a growth in the right eye, which was rapidly growing since one and a half months. Uh, on examination, I could see a papillomatous and plate-like growth on the conjunctiva involving the cornea as well. There were two feeder vessels that were feeding into the lesion. Uh, a clinical diagnosis of OSSN was made and the plan to do a wide excision biopsy with a no-touch technique along with cryotherapy and AMG under local anesthesia was done. The tissue was sent for histopathology. So this is the surgical video of the same patient after staining the lesion with rose bengal. The four millimeter uh, area was marked from the lesion to denote and two millimeters from the cornea to denote the side, side of the excision. After this marking, uh, alcohol swab was placed on the area of the cornea to assist alcohol assisted deal, uh, epithelectomy. After that, the area is marked and 15 number blade is being used to peel off the epithelium from that area. After doing this, uh, hemostasis is achieved, especially for the feeder vessels, which were very large vessels. Then the conjunctiva is carefully excised from holding from the edges trying not to touch the tumor as much as possible to avoid any seeding of the tumor cells and any um, uh, spread of the carcinogenic uh, cells after this subconjunctival dissection is done initially a sharp dissection is done from the normal area however when the abnormal area is approached mostly a blunt dissection as well as uh, hemostasis is achieved once the uh, base of the lesion, luckily there was no infiltration in the underlying spila. Once the base was separated, uh, even the epithelium was scraped off and the whole tissue in total was sent for histopathology on a Wattman's filter paper. Uh, after this, after the lesion was removed, hemostasis was achieved and cryotherapy was done. The cryotherapy was basically done towards the base of the lesion as well as towards the conjunctival edges to prevent any um, spreading of the tumor cells if any residual is left. So for the cryotherapy, a cryoprobe is um, put and an ice ball is achieved. As soon as the ice ball is achieved, uh, it is thawed with the help of a saline. Um, double freeze thaw technique was used both for the base as well as for the conjunctiva. After that, an AMG was placed on the surface. Now this AMG was to cover all the bare area uh, since uh, and glued with the help of a glue and anchoring suture. Since the uh, area of excision was just around six clock hours. Uh, liberal stem cell transplant was not done. However, the patient was informed that he may need that later on. After the surgery, this is how the patient looked on the third day post-op. Um, with no bare sclera opposed, AMG is looking very well opposed, as well as uh, the there is no uh, evidence of any mass-like lesion. After six weeks, this is how the patient looked like, and um, his histopathology definitely showed carcinoma in C2, grade three. The patient, because considering this diagnosis, the patient was put on six cycles of chemo or topical mitomycin, 0.04%, one week on and one week off. Although the margins were clear, we didn't want to give any chance for recurrence. So topical mitomycin C was decided to be given. The patient was very tolerant to the um, chemotherapy and he remains tumor-free since eight months post-operatively. He's been regularly followed up. This is the second case who is a 77-year-old male with who presented to us with just complaints of redness, irritation, and photophobia. He had been treated elsewhere as chronic conjunctivitis patient. However, on examination, there was a very clear cut mass like lesion on the conjunctiva as well as on the superior cornea. The lesion, which also stained with the rose bengal, this lesion looked very much classical of carcinoma in C2. However, um, and the diagnosis of left eye diffuse OSSN was made. However, we did not uh, want to go ahead with the excision because the lesion was quite widespread. Hence, uh, an impression cytology on acetate paper was done and dysplastic cells with ATPR were found. So uh, the decision was made to first reduce the tumor load by chemo reduction and then reassess 
and probably plan an excision for this patient. So the patient was started with topical MMC 0.04%. One week on, one week off cycles. The first week post, post the treatment, the results were very encouraging and the patient had almost resolution of 90% of the lesions. After four cycles of chemotherapy, although he developed severe anterior scleritis, uh, for which he was given topical steroids, which resolved in a week or so, and then the rest of the cycles were continued. After six cycles uh, of chemotherapy, the patient uh, had no evidence of residual lesions, the patient had no congestion, no mass lesions, and the patient was very, very comfortable. Uh, he, he's been following up since 18 months with no evidence of recurrence. Hence, uh, diagnosis of ocular surface uh, neoplasia is very important and to know that uh, timely treatment and correct treatment uh, can yield excellent results in these cases. The, the fact that it is not very metastatic is very uh, encouraging as well. Um, thank you so much for your patient listening. So, um, sir, I think we are encroaching on the next session. Yeah, I think so. I would request you to give the closing remarks for the session, please. And thank you for chairing the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a nice session. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, all these speakers have spoken very well. Uh, thank you. So, I think we have exceeded our time. I think we should leave the hall. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I thank you all. Thank all of you. Sorry for the initial technical glitch. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, sir, for the thank you Dr. Thank you. Uh,